think we can begin now. Uh, so this is Arvind. Uh, I'm one of the trustees of Devopedia, and this event is brought to you by Devopedia Foundation. Today's talk is about uh, how to do or get started with asynchronous programming in Python. And to deliver this talk, we have uh, Shruti Sagar. So a brief introduction to uh, brief uh, introduction to Shruti. He's a web developer. In fact, he's a full stack web developer. And as can be expected, uh, full stack means that you should be uh, well versed with both the back end as well as front end technologies and tools. So Shruti knows uh, Python, Flask, Django, REST APIs. So that is these are some of the you know back end uh, tools and technologies. From the front end perspective, he knows React, Vue, uh, obviously CSS and those kind of things. In terms of databases, he has worked on Tortoise, so ORM, uh, and then for real time. Uh, analytics and real time uh, data management. He has worked with RabbitMQ. So as you can see, his uh, skill set is very diverse. Currently, he works as a software developer with Greenbull Group. And before that, uh, he was a software engineer with Do, uh, which is also in the UAE, Dubai, UAE. He, in terms of education, he has a Bachelor of Engineering from Jyoti Institute of Technology. And then he's got a master's degree in data science from Bits Pilani. So with that a short introduction, I hand over to Shruti. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, thank you, Arvind. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for the opportunity. Uh, to start with, before uh, I start with my presentation, I would like to say uh, that Devopedia has given me a wonderful opportunity I have been with Devopedia from really a long time. I have been working with. I have I have been a student in Devopedia when it start when I was in my engineering days. So now I am I am very much honored to be presenting a small talk uh, on some of the things that I know. So I would like to start my talk today. Uh, I hope my screen is visible. Um, Yes, so, we can see it. Yeah. Uh, to start with, uh, uh, we will see why do we need asynchronous Python. So let's go with a real life scenario. Uh, let's consider a hotel where you have chef, waiter, and cleaner. So how uh, there are there is a cycle of events. You uh, you go into the hotel, you order the food to a waiter, chef prepares and waiter gives the food to you and you are not the only person. Uh, there are many people who come to hotel and you there is no nothing like one chef per user or one chef per customer. One chef prepares for multiple customers and similarly if you consider and waiter and cleaner also does the same thing. Uh, there is nothing like you will never have one chef per or one chef, one waiter per customer. When, while you order, chef is preparing for someone else and cleaner is cleaning some other table. And similarly, the cycle continues. So this is how exactly asynchronous Python, what we are looking at today. So this is exactly the reason uh, so that your uh, resources are consumed less and there is no waiting period. Uh, like when there is waiting, the resources are doing something else rather than just uh, sitting idle. And even when you consider manufacturing of a car, various parts like tires are manufactured somewhere, engine parts are manufactured somewhere, and then assembling is done at one place at the end. But that is the end result. So when you consider similarly, there are many things uh, in a request response cycle or in a task that happens in a system that there is some waiting period uh, where we have to handle it. So that when there is idle period, the resources are not just idle, they do something else. 
So what is asynchronous programming? That means a process that operates independently of another. Uh, the way we program so that a process operates independently of other process is what asynchronous programming is. So an example on a programming scenario, uh, you submit some data, user submit some data and it has to go and sit in the database. Let's say you create a post and uh, while the user has to move to another screen, the moment user starts clicks on create post uh, and he can see the next posts that are created previously like just before him. So by the time this data is stored in the database, there are some other set of tasks that happen like the data has to be cleaned and the security has to be tested to make sure the data is uh, like uh, people don't post some uh, wrong data or some data which is uh, not legally acceptable. So such tasks has to happen before storing in the database. So these things can happen in the background while user still goes viewing other screens or viewing others post. So we want this to happen in the background. If we say user your post is being processed, please wait. It affects the uh, read if, uh, user experience. So there is if we have seen people don't wait for delays. Uh, because of the way we are moving in the world, delays is something that people can never wait for. They want one thing and they just leave it. They want the next one to be ready for them. So we want for this we use asynchronous programming. Mainly. Now what is the connection with async IO library? That we are going to look in today. So any task or program has one of these bottlenecks either IO bound like any task is either IO bound or CPO bound. IO bound is a task where we just spoke earlier some of the like you are reading from a file or reading from database or reading from a third party server and you are waiting. For us waiting there and doing nothing is what we are considered. While CPU bound is something that processing of large data where you need more memory and more process pro, uh, CPU uh, runtime to be utilized. For IO bound operations, we don't want CPU or we just are waiting for some other task that is happening in the background or we are just waiting for reading read operation from disk because we know reading from a disk is always the slowest process in the system in a application. So for IO bound operations, we are considering uh, async asynchronous programming and for that we have a very good library in Python called async IO. Now people are always confused. We are always confused with concurrency, parallelism and threading. So concurrency is what uh, we can say as multiple tasks that run in same in overlapping periods. It is an illusion that multiple tasks are happening because CPU switches between tasks so fast that we think it's a parallel programming, but it's just one single core that does. And concurrency is what it's just managing multiple e e instructions at same time and parallelism is multiple instruction sequences that is you have multiple instructions and um, you run them at the same time while concurrency is just managing multiple instructions at the same time. We can achieve concurrency using threading and parallelism for parallelism. Uh, concurrency is an example of IO bound operation while parallelism is an example of CPU bound operation. We can say and concurrency is only one system, one CPU core while concurrency is more CPU cores and each has its own isolated environment to 
work. Now, uh, this is uh, this is the serial that we can see is a parallel task. That is, we have some task T1, T2 and IO weight operation. While IO weight, we are doing IO weight, we could do something else. If you can see the image here, you, we are saving this much amount of time by just using concurrency in our programming. So this is a lot if we consider. Because we always uh, the resource. If you consider a cloud resources are always built uh, for the time they are used. So now we have less number of. Resource utilization or because waiting time is reduced. This is a, a very clear example of how it works. As, as we progress with the time, we have three tasks with three different colors and we have three processing units or three cores CPUs you can consider and this task. Now there is a wait with uh, task one. You can consider this as a waiting period during which T1 T2 or the red color task can be completed. And part of a task three also can be completed while the CPU is waiting. So now rather than using three CPUs, we are just using one CPU to complete all the three tasks. This is where we look at concurrency or concurrency. Concurrent programming and this is achieved through async asynchronous programming. And we have a uh, Python has one uh, feature called GIL Gro global interpreter lock, which is something that controls and which uh, controls how uh, multi threading or multi programming, multitasking and even concurrent programming can be done. So this is one of the process that uses uh, that this is the main feature of programming uh, Python which says uh, one process can use the data structures available in the memory at one at a given time. You cannot let's say we have two process process one can execute only after completion of process process two can execute only after completion of process one. This is one of the reason why it uh, Python is faster. Uh, when we consider Python as faster, we say uh, Python is making faster, which means uh, P if you just Google, it says Python is slower compared to some other some of the programming languages. But now when I say global interpreter lock, which makes execution faster, this is not in comparison with other programming languages. This is just a comparison of Python uh, that is with the use of global interpreter lock. You make things better in Python. Yeah, so next one, but now we said global interpreter lock handles uh, makes only one process to execute at a time. But now how does asynchronous programming handle multiple process execution? So every executing task or process uh, has its own local variable called thread local. And there every time there is a context switch, we use something called context variables, which also helps in making asynchronous programming much better, like which makes asynchronous programming in Python possible. Now with all this, we have to know how it works. So there is something called an event loop. So you have multiple tasks and. We have let's we have just considering three tasks. IO or CPU bound task network task and you have some delay task like you specifically specify. I just want to delay. 
So event loop is the one that controls all the tasks. So every time we want a asynchronous task to be handled, we just add that task into an event loop with a callback. So every uh, and it uh, the event loop handles it like once the call once the event is complete, it adds a loop, it all adds a callback and it checks if the events are completed and uh, the callbacks are the ones that does the next necessary tasks. So now this is all fine, but this is what I have heard from the people like uh, asynchronous programming is really difficult in Python and it's something very new in Python. This was even my assumption until and until I started digging deep into Python uh, into this program asynchronous programming through some of the video lectures that I got through. Asynchronous programming, you if I'm not wrong, Python itself was introduced in 1991. So asynchronous programming is started way back in mid 90s. So it is almost there from the time Python is there, but not it was not so much mature. We can say and uh, it was relying more on operating system calls. Uh, so we have something called system. We have system calls which uh, which are used for operating system calls. So we have a select which is used as a solution uh, to control or reduce the wastage of CPU lag for network calls. So we have a couple of libraries that was introduced. And with the help of this select so event uh, select system calls, we uh, people were able to create event loops and also able to create make the whole function asynchronous. Medusa, one of the earliest Python web libraries was introduced by Samuel in early 90s and Google initial web server uh, Yahoo SMTP was based on this Medusa library and Samuel, the one who created Medusa, he took out the asynchronous parts because uh, Creating an event loop manually every time you wanted was like a more painful task and it was bound to have more errors. So he created a library called async core, async core, which was later introduced in Python second beta release. And if you can see, it is still available in Python 3.10, which is the latest version, but it is not actively developed, but it is only main for backward compatibility. So we still have the first version or the very starting versions of asynchronous programming. So we are still relying on those features. So we can never say asynchronous Python is relatively new. It's just that it was not people were not more aware of it. I can say or it was not handled well when it started because Python was rela uh, uh, relatively new, but then we have something called twisted, which is a, a Python framework which is still used and which was released in early 2000s, which was even before PEP 8. PEP 8 is the Python standard coding uh, 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 definitions. So even even then Google started using twisted Apple and even Apple used it for all the tasks like DNS load balancing. And other tasks and then we have tornado. Which was another framework which was released in 2009 and even this has support for Python 2, which uh, which is, is no more in real life, uh, which is no more supported Python 2 is no more actively developed, but still Tornado has support for Python 2, which means there is a lot of 
history behind it so which we cannot ignore also we have uh, some libraries called starlet which was again in mid started in mid uh, 20 2010 2010 and even that is actively developed and even that that has proper async io library which we are going to see and the latest one which is called fast api which we are which has got a wide popularity since it was uh, introduced completely works on asynchronous library async io library and it also has compatibility and it also has built in features for uh, database connectivity asynchronously so these are some uh, i can say uh, fast api was built on top of starlet and fast api is relatively new it is somewhere around 2 to 2 and 1/2 years old library which is very good library and being used by lot of companies if you can see so it is a wonderful library to work on and it has a lot of better features uh most of the features that django has it also has it is like a mix of we can say django and flask not to be very uh, like it's not mix some of the good features of django has have been taken in some of the good features of flask have been taken in uh, features of django like uh, having its own uh, documentation and lightweight features of flask have been all inducted in fast api so it's really good library if you can use it with all these basic introduction of how it came into the picture and how it was all going on let's see how it works in a real time scenario uh arvind is my screen visible now also yeah it's yeah, visible it's little, maybe font can increase little bit yeah yeah yes that's good okay so we are just this is we i have seven basic examples async io like of async io but async io is lot more than this just for a basic introduction i have opened this up i have made this so let's see how it runs first so let so i've created a virtual environment with python 3.10 which is the latest one you can see august 22 release so i'll start with python yeah there was a delay because we have added async io dot sleep so this is how you can say this is a io operation system is doing nothing but just sleeping so this is one example to start off this is the most basic it uses these are called coroutines which async and await are the coroutines which are similar to what javascript has promises so if people if you have used javascript also has await async all these so it is made similar to that so that people can understand it easier also and now it's a uh, program where we uh, where uh, we let's say we'll start running a program uh, to run indefinitely so i have three examples uh, i'll start with keep printing let's see what keep printing does it just says while it's true print and sleep for 0.5 seconds it does nothing else first program so yeah we can see it is sleeping and executing sleeping and executing now when we interrupt when we close we have a keyboard interrupt so we can handle all these with try catch errors like you can see here try and accept 
async io uh, except uh, keyboard interrupt we can say key user has interrupted it and see you can see this is uh, async io dot run is what if we go through this it says the documentation it says a pass as uh, the function runs pass the core routine so we are passing a core routine if you go deep into it and it says all what it does so it cannot be uh, so it also fetches the event loop and executes async io dot run now let us see one uh, now let us remove this await we will see what happens when we see there is no it's never stopped there is never stopped but we the errors are still the same if we can see but this is never async io dot sleep is not awaited that means the system does not sleep because we are not so await is used to say wait till the execution of this So wait till async io is sleep. Let's we will do two seconds. We will know how it makes a difference. See you. We, we can see the difference is two seconds here. So this is where uh, this comes into picture. Now await. If you don't use await, it just keeps running on its own. Now let's go into the next example. that says wait for the execution wait for it says wait for the execution of this for 10 seconds if the program does not complete its execution in 10 seconds just kill it so we have this time out error and we say time out so let us run this now I think I did not save the file. Yes, we say we are not awaited. So this is what we get an error when we don't await. So we will see where here. This is what we had. even here so this always async io dot run is the one that fetches the current event loop which we saw earlier and executes see now it's all over now the timeout is completed it says timeout error because we waited for 10 seconds and it did not wait uh, as soon as 10 seconds were over it says timeout error and it stopped execution with an error now let us see what this does async main it just wait for it prints and it waits here this is much better handling of timeout error we can this is a better handling of timeout error that's it let's run this not save it again yes we still say uh cancelled due, due to timeout error so this is where we use uh, so maybe we can just handle say the event was not handled properly and do whatever we want when timeout error happens that is where we use this the next one which is a really interesting one you can say 
this is something that we all are waiting for running multiple tasks at the same time so i have some random function or uh, saying call api so call api i am calling it twice with a delay of 3 seconds i have specified delay big uh, assuming the api returns after 3 seconds we have a real time example also but before that we use gather we will see this because it's a basic example and then we will go into comparison with real time scenario now what we are doing is we are waiting we are just see we do not have await here we have to even though it is asynchronous task we are not writing await here but we are just calling two functions two methods and we are returning the result and just printing it let us see how this runs see we have a delay of 3 seconds so but the uh, the api 1 and 2 was already called but then we have having a delay if you can see we we are first printing then we have a delay uh, we will make it more so that we will have time to see how it actually ran now calling api 1 and 2 is done that is printing and then we are waiting for uh, uh, the response that is delay and then we are returning but both the task have already been started execution is what we can say so that is where we use gather and then we have the big example that is comparison yes so i have uh, first we'll see what main does so i have time start with performance counter which just uh, says how much time it took so uh, what it does we will see what so we have function 1 and then we have using gather let us see what this does so get it just uses requests library and it returns the title of the user so let us see first uh, on a browser what this is yeah we have a huge set of posts i will say one it just returns this nothing else so we have user id id body title so in this we are just copying we are just returning the title and this is the same thing that we are using with asynchronous also but we are using in a different way we will go into it in our last to one example that is we are using contexts we are we will see about that later there so now we have this performance counter we are just printing how much time it took uh, to execute both of the tasks so we are using 20 we are fetching 20 documents i can say so now if i run for comparison dot py see synchronous took 8 seconds while asynchronous took 0.06 which is not even fraction of what synchronous took this is where asynchronous is more useful for us where you run multiple tasks so we are just uh, generating a an array or generating a list of all the asynchronous functions that we are that we want and putting them uh, and we are just running this is the same that we have done here rather than writing one by one i have just made a list comprehension to run all those functions at once and this is the difference that we get 
when we run synchronously and asynchronously so basically everything runs on the background and once the re uh, re result is returned you can even uh, let's say we will print result uh, so result if you do we will be able to handle all the results in an order yeah, the same way we will we can do here also result equals and we just print the results we will be able to but if i add this uh, readability is will be difficult but we will see how it runs yep now we can see it's now the time is reduced because it has been cached even though it has been cached the time is still less in asynchronous it's almost less than half now we can say so the data is still the same the order is not disrupted if you can see first one is no title it's all the same still so this is how we can fetch the results and we also have found methods where we can handle errors or we have all of them but we are not reading all of them now we are just seeing how it runs on a basic level but we have when an error occurs how do we handle it we have all of them readily available in asynchronous now now let's see what event loop is yes we have this we are creating a new event loop and we are setting an event loop and we are just creating a task in a loop and we we run the loop until it's complete or we can say we can run forever running executor is the one that helps us run as a parallel process multi threading and we can check if the loop is running or not we have so we have lot of functions like that uh, we will just say run until complete now so we created a new event loop of our own we ran it till, uh, and we set the event loop to whatever we created and we created a task which we put into our loop and we executed like you can add multiple tasks now i can say i can add the same loop again and it goes on so you can add how many ever tasks that you want into this loop so this is a basic example of how you can create an event loop by your own now you can ask me i have not created an event loop here if uh, by default asynchronous from the version 3.8 creates a loop event loop on its own you don't have to create it manually but if you want a new loop of your own this is how we can create so this is something which is much better as we from the version 3.8 you can say helpful also you don't have these many things are not now needed by you you just say async io dot run until complete and run forever you can say all that you can get all the all of them here so that is where asynchronous is asynchronous async io library is getting better and better day by day version by version we can say and then we have contexts so for people who don't know what contexts are so context let's say uh, you have a operation where you want to read a file suppose you do it manually you open a file how it the reading of file how it happens you create a file you first open the file read or write whatever you want and then close the file that is how file work uh, that is how the whole process works let's say you forget to close the file what happens the file might get corrupted file might be 
return by some other process because you have not closed the file or anything can happen to avoid this and every time you open you have to close so that is like writing more same thing again and again rewriting the same so that is where see we have session uh, that is where we use context manager that means setting up a resource that we want and closing the resource once it is complete so if you can see here in a comparison to that we have written i see so i have uh, a session so now i have written like this as session with the you help of with uh, fun, uh, with keyword in python we uh, we can use contexts by default but let's say we have something more than this uh, we can still do it so in context now i have created a context manager which is available in context library in python so these are only the only libraries that i have installed is io http which is used to make http call xml http call but the rest all of them async io context library are all native to python from 3.4 so you don't have it comes by default so what i am doing it yields yield is another keyword which is used to handle the task that we want now so now i am doing uh, with client dot session so this is let's say i once the session is closed i want to uh, write into uh, my database saying uh, the library the session was used by so and so person uh, whatever we want if you want to do that here uh, in the example that we saw earlier in the comparison we have to write it every time we open a session here rather what we are doing we can just do whatever we want only at one place and you can use this uh, client session anywhere that you want that is where we use this context managers along with closing of course this is also there along with that these things come into handy you never know what you want to do every time you open a file or you open a session anything so now let's see how this runs see we still get the same it just now let us see what happens if i don't close the session i am using only this so that i don't have to rewrite all of this that i have here so if i go to context you get a error saying unclosed client session which is the tcp connector and it has what all the errors so we have to close the session so we just run like this so errors are not there and the context library handles closing of this all of it and now we have the last one running synchronous uh, functions in asynchronous library that is one of the things that we always have to think of because not all libraries that we have in python today are supporting async because lord there are tons of libraries and most of them are never thought of writing with asynchronous support so that is where we have to see how it is able to run we have we also have um, some of the functions that uh, i am showing you one example uh, we will see this yeah it says sync hello sync hello see it happens one by one on its own so that is where we are handling it but still see in create task where is our create task uh, do stuff is saying we are waiting for first asynchronous function which sleeps over once again 
and then it executes. This is async IO sleep and this is the default time dot sleep. So even here I am sleeping for one second, which is again a synchronous function while this is asynchronous. And this is how we handle it in this. We also have uh, running in executors, which is which helps us running parallelly and all of them. Uh, but that is like too advanced and even I have not gone through most of them. These are some of the things that I have encountered in my uh, daily software that I'm working on. So I just wanted to show, share whatever I have because when I started these were really not available like not easily available. I had to go through a lot of YouTube tutorials and all of that. So I thought maybe I just share how to start with this library for people who are new to it. So once you are familiar with all of this, you can start going deeper into it so that it helps you understand much better. Yep. Yeah. so with this I would uh, like to complete my session and for people uh, now let's have some discussions I would say because uh, it's very new for me also. So let's have a discussion session rather than Q and A session. Thank you, Shruti. Uh, anyone wants to add something? Yeah, go ahead, Chetan. Uh, yeah, so actually, um, in uh, one example, uh, I think uh, the file number two, where you know, uh, I think you showed the timeout error. So I have a doubt over there. Uh, yes. So yeah, yeah. Uh, so line number twenty and twenty-two. So there are you know two awaits. Uh, uh, <laughs> So with the waiter equal to await, I think I uh, wait for, and inside the try also. So uh, this uh, you know uh, that async I uh, uh, wait for uh, does it uh, actually return the awaitable object after having await? So I I'm no, it does not return an awaitable object because waiting here. So it returns the result of uh, KP that is key printing. It returns the result, which is none in our case. So it does not return an awaitable object, but awaitable object is returned in this case. If you can see, it returns an awaitable object, and all these return an awaitable object. And at the end, I am waiting for all the results at once. Yeah, I understood that, but inside the try, you also you know have the await a waiter. So I'm a bit confused over. How you know it's working uh, with await? So to have await uh, the you know at the line number twenty, the waiter you know should be awaitable if you uh, want to have it with await, right? Uh, yes, yes, but it does not do it like that. We have to wait for because we have keep printing. If you can see, see we have two functions here async io dot wait for this is a async async io await and we are waiting for this one to complete keep printing to complete oh, oh so okay, yeah. this I, now, yeah, now, now i understood 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 yes. now yes thank you yeah welcome If no one have any other question, then I think uh, uh, I should think you can highlight, you know, some uh, uh, use case like uh, uh, where we should use async or uh, where we shouldn't use async. So like, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I'll tell you the, the the use case that we are using async. 
so maybe that will help others also so we are basically building a trade tool a trading software so uh, by the time uh, the trade software returns us the response we are doing nothing so we are doing we are using asynchronous at that place so because we have to wait for the trade uh, the same api because trade is again an api so till that returns the response we are awaiting waiting so that is one use case i can say or maybe you are writing something into database some uh, let's say a huge data that uh, you have as i said earlier uh, once the user starts to writing in writing a post or writing something in his uh, system uh, writing in his in the software uh, you have to first make sure there are no legal issues that you will be facing one if the post is posted and then uh, if he uploads a file or an image you have to make sure uh, there is no security issue for that that means the uh, it does not contain any virus or anything as such and if it's a uh, trade uh, if there is any trademark added into that someone else or if it's a copyrighted content and you are just trying to copy it you have to do a background job so till this time these are multiple processes that can happen parallelly you can uh, maybe you can push uh, these tasks into uh, your machine learning tool or any tool but this can run parallelly one with another so you just create all of these simultaneously and if one of this returns false you just don't save the uh, post if not you save the post so this is one example of asynchronous where you can use while where you cannot use uh, you have huge data processing which has to happen one after another let's say uh, there is something that has to process one after another but each of them are time consuming this is where you use multi processing multi core so you wait for completion of one process and then you pass it to the next there is where result of the second first task is sir, the task 2 is waiting for result of first task this is where you cannot use asynchronous programming because each of them happen parallelly so basically uh, you know where the dependency is on the input and and output majorly i think there we can use async otherwise we should have to you know, go with yes, other options we always right? avoid using it because we have to wait till the response is coming so it is not recommended at that places right i also put this uh, all the code that i have written in a repository and share in the same page that we have also i'll add all the links that i have gone through to study because uh, they are really difficult to find tutorials and most of them are compatible with 3.4 and 3.8 and with 3.10 most of them not most of them some of them like i said earlier creating a event loop are not supported it gives you errors so we have to go through the uh, python documentation also along with some of the tutorials that are available for especially for this library anyone else has anything to add to this so uh, this is arvin here any yes. books or any uh, recommendations 
YouTube tutorials or any uh, blogs? Yeah. Uh, like I said, uh, there is one uh, amazing tutorial that I started with uh, uh, written by HDB. It's a YouTube tutorial. Also, there is there are some links that are available on uh, on some websites where they have five uh, five blog posts or such where they explain how they are using it in their real life application. So I'll share them. I'll share them. Uh, yeah, if you can, you can. Yeah, you can share it here. Anyway, later these links uh, we will put it on our YouTube uh, when this video is uploaded. In the description, we will add these links. Uh, yeah, I'll I'll send you them. All yeah. yeah. Now, in one example, you uh, sh showed us the effect of caching. Yes. So is that because of the session? You have a session created uh, a HTTP. Where is the caching happening? No, it. Uh, I mean, the, the general case that happens when you uh, in our DNS servers, not the. Now, if I just increase this to 200, uh, it will show us the more time that it takes. So this is the general caching that happens on the browser, not on our machine. I can say. But there's no browser here, no? Uh, uh, yeah, but uh, I mean the DNS because we are hitting the server. Or uh, some kind of I, I think that is why it uh, the difference we got. Yeah, it's actually the local you know, DNS caching. Yes. Uh, now I just made 40 and we will see how it runs. So this is the difference that we are getting. Yeah, if this is the case, then uh, you know the caching. Uh, see, the uh, asynchronous calls are benefiting from the caching due to the synchronous calls. Uh, yes, I got your point. Maybe we'll just put them up and down and we will see. Uh, even then, even though uh, synchronous was uh, benefited now in our case, it took a little more time, I can say. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, any other questions from others? OK, uh, no questions. Uh, yeah, Chetan, go ahead. Uh, not, yeah, so not a question, only actually, actually a suggestion for the newcomers who are, you know, um, are new to async IO. So uh, actually a suggestion is, um, uh, so to understand, you know, async IO better, the prerequisition is, uh, I, I, uh, you should know the routine, actually the coroutine and the subroutine. So those are the best for the async IO. That's it from. Thank you for that. Yeah. So with that, uh, yeah, I would like to thank Shruti for uh, giving this talk. Even though he is new to this topic, he has taken the effort to prepare many useful examples. And these the links to these examples I will share on the YouTube description when this uh, video goes live on our channel. So do take uh, go through these examples plus the other links that he will share.